Hello, everyone. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Lauren E. Cayetano, the Luminous Vision Marketing Manager. Um, just a quick background on who we are before we kick off this um, webinar. Luminous Vision is a proud inventor of Intense Pulse Light, SLT, and the first argon photocoagulator. We're renowned for technological breakthroughs in atomic light based devices with a long a list of industry gold standards. With over 50 years of presence in the eye care industry, Luminous Vision has focused on providing eye care providers with innovative therapies to preserve and improve the sight of patients worldwide. In collaboration with the American Society of Optometric uh, uh, Surgeons, we are bringing you a webinar series focused on the interior segment laser and IPL technology. Joining us today is Dr. Richard Castillo. Dr. Richard Castillo has been the NSU Dash OCO's Chief of Surgical Services and Principal Surgeon since 1998, serving his community of Tahlequah, Oklahoma as an optometric physician and comprehensive ophthalmologist. He is a past recipient of the Oklahoma Association of Optometric Physicians Distinguished Service Award in 2017, has been honored as the first ophthalmologist to be named Distinguished Friend of the Illinois College of Optometry in 2019, and has been acknowledged by the Oklahoma State Board of Examiners in Optometry for outstanding contributions to the advancement of optometric surgical care in 2016. Dr. Casillo is the recipient of the special uh, citation from the Oklahoma House of Representatives for his contribution to the advancement of surgical eye care in the state of Oklahoma in 2015. With his arrival, Dr. Casillo established the present NSU-OCO Outpatient Optometric Surgical Procedures Student and Resident Training Clinic in 1999, training scores of optometric uh, faculty, students and residents, as well as DO and MD colleagues in optometric, dermatologic, and laser procedures in clinical medicine for over two decades. Dr. Castillo is one of the original founding members of the NSU Advanced Procedures CE Laser and Surgery course in 1999, a past commissioner and chair of the National Commission on Vision and Health and has served as a physician reviewer of the Health Resources and Services Admin and has volunteered with the Oklahoma Medical Reserve Corps. Dr. Casillo has served on multiple committees for the National Board of Examiners and Optometry, including the Laser Surgical Examination Task Force Development Committee and has been contributing to optometric education nationwide since 1995. He maintains a very active national CME lecture schedule and has continued to serve as an educational and practice consultant, as well as a wavering advocate for the advancement and modernization of state optometry laws. He will conclude this collaborative uh, webinar series of the year with a talk on managing complications of laser therapy. Just a quick housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the questions box in your GoToWebinar panel. We'll answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Now, without further ado, we'll turn the time over to Dr. Casillo. Dr. Casillo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lorne. And uh, I have to, first off, apologize. I am on a, about an 11-year-old laptop here at the university. Um, I rush home from clinic, and I get to my house, and guess what? The internet is not working. Now, mind you, we are in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, so that happens. But of course, it had to happen tonight, all right? So I get in my car and I rush over to the university. And what I have here is, uh, like I said, an 11 year old laptop. The video doesn't look too good. I don't know what the audio sounds like. Um, what I may do is later this week, I'm probably going to re record this because, again, I don't know if, if the audio is coming through. Uh, very well, but I will re-record this, and that's what we will put on the uh, on the website. All right, so apologies uh, again. Rural internet—that's all I can. That's my only defense. All right, so I'm assuming that we are all online. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, anterior segment laser complications. Uh, I'm going to try to give you my perspective on all this. Um, this does, by the way, wrap up our uh, six six webinar series, uh, and the theme for this fall has been lasers. So uh, if you have any questions over this, over anything else that uh, we've talked about this fall, uh, the end of this presentation would be a good time to ask those questions. 
All right, now let me see if I can get. Uh, there we go, it's working. So, uh, we, you know, generally in optometry, we talk about SLT, peripheral iridotomy, and uh, yeah, cal. Okay. But there are lots of things you can do with lasers. You know, if you have a laser, you're probably going to find uses for that laser. And the thing is that, uh, you know, if you look at the complications, and I've listed, I started listing everything I could think of here, and the font started getting too small, so I just quit. Okay, so there's probably more than what we have here. But the thing is, and what no one really tells you, especially the politicians on the other side, you know, the political opposition is never really going to get up and say, you know what, if we look at these complications that we uh, see from anterior segment lasers specifically, the dirty little secret is most of them are not actually unique to lasers. Okay? As ODs, we already know how to manage these. In fact, we manage these day in and day out. Okay, there, there's nothing, you know, here other than probably pitting of the pitting the IOL. Okay, that I'd say is unique to a laser. But most of the other things that we're going to encounter that we could encounter, you're already encountering and you already manage. Okay, so this should all be pretty much review. Okay, and, and I, I love giving this course uh, here at NSU to the students especially the fourth years. And I start by saying, you know what? You already knew how to manage all this before you even walked in here. And they look at me and go, what? And I go, because most of the complications that we deal with are not, to, with regards to lasers, are not unique to lasers, okay? So let's get, a hot, get on with this and you, you're gonna see what I mean. Now, the one that probably is unique to lasers, hitting of the lens, okay? So what can I tell you about pitting the lens? Don't, don't pit the lens. I mean, that's, that's you know, how do you manage that? Don't pit the lens, okay? But there are some things that you need to know about this, okay? Number one, if you look at the statistic here, 15 to 33% of eyes, okay, that are treated with a YAG for purposes of a capsulotomy are gonna get a few pits, regardless of who is doing the procedure, okay? If you go online, and research this a little bit, and you look at all those fabulous photos, okay, especially photos that probably predated around 1989, you got to realize that all those pits were put in there by an ophthalmologist somewhere. Okay, <laughs> we didn't start doing these in Oklahoma until the late 80s. Okay, and, and I would I would bet that most of the things that you find online with regards to lens pits like this were done by an ophthalmologist or an ophthalmology resident. So. Okay, keep that in mind. Also, understand that not all cases, you know, you may have capsular pacification. That doesn't mean that that patient necessarily is a good laser candidate. Okay, and that's that's nothing. Uh, it doesn't speak to your skills or what you know or you don't know. It's just that some people are not laser candidates. Period. End of story. Okay. So if you can't see or if you can't focus well. Okay, if there are scars or edema, or the patient is not cooperating, you know, let's blame the patient. The patient is not cooperating. Okay, they can't fixate. That may not be a good laser candidate. Okay, and it's got nothing to do with who's doing the procedure. Okay, um, there are some old, old IOLs, and I don't know that I've actually seen a glass or PMMA IOL in 20 years. Um, those we had to actually be very careful with because those actually could fracture. Um, patients with uh, active inflammation, you know what, maybe we ought to wait, quiet the eye down before we go ahead and do the capsulotomy, okay? Um, so patients with active inflammation, probably not good candidates at that moment. Doesn't mean we can't do the procedure, but you know, let's deal with uh, the, the inflammation first tune them up, so to speak, and then the procedure will go, you know, a little bit better for all concerned, okay? Now, I have been to lots of CE where they've talked about capsulotomy and where they've shown these pictures with, you know, the pitting. Um, most of these speakers will actually turn right around to the audience or address the audience and say, you know, pitting is not such a big deal. You know, everybody's going to have some pits. And most of the time, it's inconsequential. You know, it doesn't affect vision. The patient's not really going to know what happened. 
Well, um, let me tell you that pitting can be significant. Okay, look at look at this. All right, look at that. Pitting can be significant. It can be visually significant. More than that, as ODs, it can be medical, legally, and very politically significant. Okay, I was um, last year. Okay, I happened to be uh, testifying in Arkansas. Okay, I, Arkansas, you know, finally cleared the last hurdle. We hope. And uh, so our colleagues in Arkansas are on their way to getting credentialed, uh, you know, before not too long. But um, one of the things the political opposition did in Arkansas was bring in a patient, I think, from Louisiana, where somebody, unfortunately, it was an OD, had severely pitted the lens. And, you know, they blew this thing up onto a screen about 10 feet. And, you know, one of the... Uh, one of the ophthalmologists that was there, actually, he's one of the Arkansas House representatives, looked at that and said, "Okay, I'll give I'll give you three or four pits, okay, but every pit after that is malpractice." And unfortunately, that lens looked like this, okay. So he started saying, "One, two, three, okay, could happen to anybody." Number four, malpractice. Number five, malpractice. Number six, malpractice. Okay. So it is an issue, okay, regardless of whether it affects the patient visually, which I'll be the first to say, you know, a couple of pits in the periphery, not going to do anything to the you know, patient, not even going to know they're there. But be aware of the political climate and understand that if you get, you know, a lens looking like this, that yes, that is significant and that is probably negligent and malpractice. I mean, if things are not working for you, don't let it get to that point. Okay. So what are some things we can do? Um, number one, adjust the patient's head. You know, take take a few minutes. Make sure that the slit lamp is adjusted, the oculars are adjusted, the patient's chin rest is, is at the right height, you know, the patient's comfortable, you're comfortable. I guarantee that makes a difference, okay? Now, things that you can do specifically, uh, you know, to help you out when you're doing a capsulotomy. Number one, use minimum energy, okay? I, I don't think I've... I can remember the last time that I was over about two millijoules. You're going to be somewhere between one and two millijoules, right? I have, I would have, uh, again, a hard time thinking back, you know, to a capsule that was so dense that I had to go above two millijoules, okay, just for a primary capsulotomy. Um, if you are getting pits, okay, and again, it will happen. It, it will happen. If you are getting pits and you are not comfortable moving through the center, don't move through the center, okay? Do the old timey, you know, you can do the horseshoe like this, or you can do the old timey Christmas tree. Start up here in the periphery, come down, okay, from like maybe 12 to about eight and from 12 to maybe four, okay? And then if you have to, you can cut across the bottom. Sometimes you're lucky and the flap will just fold back. If you don't have to cut the flap free, by the way, don't, because sometimes that can uh, cause issues with floaters. But, uh, you know, if you're getting pits and, you know, you've adjusted everything and, you know, maybe the patient is not cooperating like they should, just avoid the center, okay? You can get it done. You don't necessarily have to go through the center, okay? Sometimes you can actually see, you know, uh, sometimes you do have, you know, very close uh, approximation or even adhesion between that capsule and the posterior surface of the lens. If you can examine, you know, shine a, a nice optic sec section through there and examine if you can find an area where there's a, a little separation between the lens and the capsule, maybe that's where you want to start then. Also, another tip is look for uh, traction bands or wrinkles through the capsule. Okay, the reason you get wrinkles, say, horizontally is because something is stretching. You know, there's probably fibrosis stretching and causing that wrinkle in whatever orientation it's happening. If you laser right on the wrinkle, the center of that, you're going to use that to your advantage and you're going to open up a wider hole, okay? So look for wrinkles. That's tension. Use tension to your advantage. Do the horseshoe or the Christmas tree if you're not comfortable moving through the center, okay? That's fine. And then look for separation between the capsule and the posterior optic, and maybe that's a good place to start it all, okay? Now, the other thing you can do is what we call the deep focus technique. If that lens capsule is just 
right up there against the optic. And no matter what you do, you're getting a pit, you're getting a pit, you're getting a pit. Push the focus back, okay? Uh, remember how uh, the YAG distributes its energy, okay? The optical focus with an offset, remember the offset, is pushed back from the, uh, excuse me, the laser focus is pushed back from the optical focus. And when uh, you press the button and you shoot the laser and you have breakdown in the anterior vitreous, uh, most of that energy then reflects forward back towards the capsule, disrupting the capsule, okay? So you can push your focus back a little bit or increase your offset, okay, if you haven't done that already. Now you may need to increase the power just a little bit. Here's where, you know, you may be a little bit over two millijoules, okay? But that's fine. We understand why and we understand what we're doing. All right, so those are just some tips then with regards to capsulotomy and the lens pitting. And just be careful. Don't let anyone tell you that a you know, lens pit is not a big deal. It's, it's not a big deal as long as you're in control, okay? This photo that we showed you here, this, whoever did that was not in control of the situation, okay? Um, so just, just keep that in mind, okay? All right. Uh, what about failure to perforate? Is that really a complication? I've had students and residents come out after, uh, you know, they, they'll go in, they're all worked up. This is my first laser. They go in and then they come out of the room all dejected. I just can't get through. If you look at the stats, you know, the statistics again will tell you that somewhere between 85 and 100 percent success rate, okay, with a laser PI. What they don't always tell you, though, is that that's not necessarily in one sitting, okay? And, uh, you know, there is no shame, especially if this is a prophylactic PI, if for whatever reason it's not happening for you that day, you know, again, maybe the patient is not cooperating. Let, let's blame the patient. The patient is not cooperating. So they are shifting around. They're startled by the, you know, the snap of the laser, the flash, and it's just not happening, okay? After you put in so much energy and you convince yourself that this is probably not going to happen within the next couple of shots, that's probably a very good time to say, okay, we're going to call it for today. You know, just tell the patient they, you know, whatever you want to tell them. You know, you've been doing great. You know what? We're going to just stop the day. We've got it partly done. We'll bring you back in a week and finish up. Okay. No shame in that. Okay. Better that than you keep hammering away at something that's not working and then you develop a real complication, okay? So in the cases of a prophylactic PI, there's no problem, okay? There's no shame going as far as you can to that one setting then bringing them back in a week or two and finishing, all right? Now, unfortunately, the cases where you really need to get through are the ones that oftentimes you have issues with, okay? Uh, you know, if you if you have a hot eye, okay, you have a, an angle closure that's been going on for a while. The eye is is red hot, you know, cornea steamy. Patient is in a lot of pain, uncomfortable. It may not happen. Okay, again, not every case is a laser case. No shame in that. Okay, if you can't see what you need to see, if you can't see the iris in the case of a PI, if the patient can't hold still for you. That's a surgic. That's not a laser case anymore. That's a surgical case. Okay, so that's a surgical referral. Okay, it's not that you didn't do anything right, or you know, it's that's a surgical case. Not all cases are laser cases. All right. Okay. Um, now, you know, I've also had situations where, for whatever reason, I'm not having good luck over here, and then you know, all of a sudden, I remember maybe I should have looked for a little crypt or you know, at least a thinner spot over here. Uh, that's fine, okay, move over. If it's not working over here and you find a better spot over here, then try that, okay? But at some point, you're gonna know that for whatever reason it's not happening today, that's a good time to stop, okay? That, that's what a good doctor would do. You stop, you reassess, either bring them back later or you refer to a colleague. All right, other issues we may encounter, uh, closure. And again, we're talking about iridotomy, closure of the iridotomy, um, different you know causes of this circulating you know acutely in the acute sense. Uh, we may be dealing with a lot of debris, okay. And if you look through your 
FTI and there are any fibers left crisscrossing, you know, if you've left any scaffolding, okay, any little strands crisscrossing the opening, uh, that will act as a scaffolding and stuff will settle, okay, and that can lead to premature closure. The other thing that happens, especially in eyes with a, with a history, okay, eyes with a history of, say, chronic uveitis, um, you get this, what we call landsliding of the pigment epithelium, okay, sort of the same reason that you get sine, posterior synechia like that in hot eyes, right, that can also uh, ruin your, your PI. Okay, so we look for that. Um, what about, uh, you know, trauma from the laser itself? You know, can that cause inflammation or enough inflammation to cause a premature closure? Well, probably more so if you're using a green laser to do the PI. Now, I will say that I don't think I've done a PI with it. I've done them, but not for a very long time. I mean, my go-to laser is the YAG. Um, but if you recall from Dr. Coyne's excellent uh, talk on laser physics and tissue interactions, you know, the, the mechanism or the tissue uh, interaction differs between the YAG and a photocoagulator, okay, the green. With the green lasers, the uh, tissue effect is actually coagulative necrosis, okay, so it's a burn and the tissue is going to respond in the way that tissue responds to a burn, and that's inflammation. So you're going to you're set up for more inflammation if you punch through with the green than with the YAG, which is more of a disruptive uh, mechanism. Okay. So again, in, in eyes with a history, I would just be a little more careful. I mean, sometimes a green is all you have, and what you have is you know what you go with. But um, you're probably going to be a little more prone to earlier closure if that's going to happen if you use a green than if you use a yeah. All right. All right. What about corneal damage? Um, if you hit the cornea, it's going to, you're going to notice it right away. Okay. <laughs> that was one of my first, uh, one of my first laser cases as an ophthalmology resident. And I, I didn't get to do any lasers as an optometry student. Um, I, you know, basically got out of NSU right before that all hit Oklahoma. But so about three, four years later, um, no, it would have been about five or six years later as an ophthalmology resident, I'm doing a laser. I forget which laser it was. And I, I guess I hit the cornea because I'm, I'm there, you know, bang, 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 bang. And all of a sudden my view turned to like rock salt or cracked glass. And I just kind of froze like this. And I could see my residency director outside here, who, by the way, had asked me, you know how to do, I think it was a PI, you know how to do a PI? And I said, sure, I watched the video, go do a PI. That, that was my uh, <laughs> baptism under fire. I just froze. I kind of do this number and she comes in and takes one look and goes cornea and walks off and just left me there like that. So I took the lens off. I told the patient, you're doing great. You know, I'm just kind of rinsing my lens off here. I washed the lens off. I re irrigated their eye. I put some more, of, I guess, goniosol. By the time I had the lens back on the eye, most of it had actually cleared, okay? And I finished the procedure. So uh, lesson learned, you know, some of these burns are very transient. Um, you know, if you keep, keep hitting it hard, you're gonna get more of a burn more of a, you know, potentially even a scar. But uh, usually this is uh, intermittent, transient, not a real problem, okay? You just don't keep hitting the same spot. Endothelial burns a little bit different. Uh, you know, what's happening here is energy is reflecting off the iris, so especially in cases where you have a very narrow angle, you know, this can happen. And what you'll probably observe there is a gradual haze as you perform the procedure. You take a shot, Take a shot, it gets hazier and hazier and hazier. That's your cue to stop and go somewhere else, okay? Don't keep hammering away at the same spot. You're likely to, you know, totally or wind up with permanent corneal decompensation, right? And we all know how to, you know, we all know how to manage corneal edema and corneal abrasions, right? You develop an abrasion, give the patient abrasion from the lens. We all know how to do that, okay? We do that week in and week out. 
Okay, so we don't need to spend time on how to manage corneal edema or corneal abrasion. Here's the one that I've seen residents turn green over, okay, and nauseous. There's bleeding inside the eye. Well, again, if you look at the statistics, and remember the iris is a muscle, and muscle is very vascular, okay, and we can't always see where those little vessels are. If you look at the statistics, you're going to see this 40 to 50 percent of the time, according to some references. Okay, so it's a complication, but it's almost, in my book, it's almost an expected complication. 40 to 50% of the time that you do a PI, you're likely to see a little trickle of blood, okay? Rare after green, because green is a photocoagulator. And we all, you know, we know that you can, from Dr. Caudill's uh, talk on, on PI, you know, in some cases you pre-treat with a green, in essence, to shut down the vasculature, or at least what you can, and then thin the iris out a little bit, and then you punch through with the yak. But still, you know, 40 to 50% of the time, you may get a little trickle of blood. Now, let me tell you that in 20 years, I've seen a lot of this, but I have never seen a significant hyphema layer out from a laser PI. Now, maybe I'm just lucky, okay? But I have never seen a hyphema, a significant hyphema, you know, layer out. In fact, some, most of the time, I, I will say I, I don't even see a hyphema layer out when it's all said and done. You know, you get... A little trickle, you get a little microhyphema. What do you do? You hold pressure with the lens, okay? You push with the lens, which is why you always want to use a lens when you're doing a PI. Okay, there are some hot shots that never use the lens. I'm not going to use a lens for the YAG cap. I'm not going to use a lens for a PI. You know, take the, the 30 seconds, you know, extra to put the stuff in the lens, put the lens on the eye. You're going to have more control and you're going to be prepared for the 40 to 50% of the time that you get this, right? And what you're gonna do is you're just gonna hold a little pressure with the lens and you're gonna lean back and you're gonna say, oh, Mr. And Mrs. Jones, you're doing great. I'm just giving you a little break here. You know, talk about what books they've read, what movies they've seen. And in a few minutes, this stops and then you finish the procedure, okay? Um, so this is not, something that you should really be losing sleep over. This is not something that you should not move into doing peripheral iridotomy, you know, with a laser, if your state allows and if you really want to do that, okay? This is manageable. This is very manageable. Plus, you know, what if you develop a hyphema? We know how to deal with hyphema, okay? As ODs, we were trained, okay? I'm sure that everybody out there has seen a hyphema. So, you know, what happens if a hyphema comes in, you know, off the street? You do your exam, you get the history. You know, when it's all said and done, it's, it's, a, it's a hyphema. So we're going to put them on steroids and maybe cyclopleach them, okay? And we're going to give them the instructions about go home and stay still and turn the lights down and no reading and no TV. Okay? We know how to manage hyphema. Generally, it's managed very conservatively, okay, with medication and, uh, you know, uh, wise decrease activity, okay? We, we manage these all the time. Um, I will say that there are some situations where you may want to evacuate the hyphema. Um, and again, we've been taught this in school, so this is really review. If, uh, if you have a significant hyphema, again, I've never seen one with a laser. If you have like a grade three, grade four, so over 50%, uh, where you're risking corneal blood staining of the cornea. Corneal blood staining of the cornea, that's good. If you have an increase in pressure along with a significant hyphema, you're gonna risk corneal blood staining, okay? So if that hyphema is layered out over the pupil and uh, it's been more than seven to 10 days, I'm probably thinking of evacuating. If the pressure's up, you know, what do we do with these folks? We also monitor the pressure. If the pressure is, you know, 22 or more, in my clinic, they're going on some sort of therapy. Okay, so we're going to give them, you know, a drop or two. If the pressure is over about 50 uh, for about five days and it doesn't look like it's coming down 
I'm probably going to evacuate them. I'm going to take them to the OR and use the INA that I used during cataract surgery, and we're going to clear out the anterior chamber. Okay, we're going to do a washout. If the if the patient is a, a sickle cell patient, this is a special case. And I, I've never, again, I've attended a lot of CE where I've heard people talk about, you know, complications of PI and bleeding and hyphema, and I've never really heard anyone talk about this. Okay? If the patient is a sickle cell patient, if, if they are sickle cell uh, homozygous, so they actually have sickle cell hemoglobinopathy, or they have sickle cell trait, okay, I'm not going to wait as long. Okay, now if if the pressure is 24, I, I, I remember the 24 for 24, a pressure of 24 for more than 24 hours that I can't get down, that's grounds for evacuation. So they go to the OR and we evacuate them. Okay, uh, whereas you know for someone that's not sickle cell, uh, 50 milligrams for, or excuse me, 50 uh, a pressure of 50 for more than five days, okay, is when I would consider. Uh, why is that in the sickle cell patient? Because under conditions of hypoxia, which is what we have when we've got blood in the anterior chamber and it sits there for a few days, those red cells will sickle, okay? One of the things that incites sickling is hypoxia or ischemia. And when those red cells sickle, now they don't make it through the trabecular meshwork okay they plug things up that's why you know sickle cell patients have sickle cell crisis because they have microvascular occlusions because those now sickled red cells are not as pliable as the regular biconcave you know red cell and uh, it's not able to squeeze through tight spaces so that's problematic for those folks they can wind up with an intractable form of glaucoma okay the the Sickle cells just plug up the meshwork. Patients with uh, hereditary spherocytosis, okay, that's another genetic condition. In fact, uh, hereditary spherocytosis is probably one of the most common inherited, uh, you know, genetic derangements as far as the blood dyscrasias is concerned. And and what happens there is that you have a defect in the red blood cell membrane so that each time the red cell passes through the spleen, remember the spleen, upper left under the ribs here, is uh, the body's oil filter. Its job is actually to get rid of old red cells, okay? And the red cell usually lives around 120 days before the spleen takes it out. And if you have hereditary spherocytosis, you have a, a membrane that is very fragile. And each time you go through the spleen, a little bit of membrane is pinched off. So what's happening is, you are decreasing the overall surface area without changing the volume, without affecting the volume in the cell. So it's kind of like a water balloon. You know, if you have a water balloon and it's half full of water and you got this big floppy thing and you start squeezing, you know, maybe twirling the, the balloon rubber around your finger, what's going to happen out here? It's going to bulge and it's going to turn into a sphere. Okay, that's just the physics of, of the thing. So that's what these red cells do. Each time they move through the spleen, um, they lose a little membrane, they lose surface area, but they still have the same volume. So they become spherical, the membrane becomes very tight. But when they become spherical, now guess what? They can't squeeze through little tight junctions or capillaries, and you're prone to occlusions. In the meshwork, you're going to gum up the meshwork, okay? So those are two situations where you may have a hyphema, okay? Or you may have even a lot of microhyphema, a lot of stuff swirling around where if you can't control the pressure and keeping uh, tabs of that pressure is very, very important in these people, then that's an indication for early uh, evacuation in the OR, okay? So just keep those two uh, scenarios in mind. All right, what about this? Uh, complication, again, once upon a time, a resident, uh, week after their first PI, came out uh, almost in tears, I caused a cataract, I caused a cataract. So I said, really? And I went in there and I remember looking, I didn't see it at first. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, uh, I don't see a cataract. I mean, I was looking for a cataract, not that, right? And uh, so I said, I'll tell you what, 
And I finally saw it. I, I, go, go to the library and do a little research on this. Come back and let me know what you find. Now, this was back when you actually had to physically go to the library and you would have the librarian do a literature search and you would actually have to go and pull these journals and look and photocopy and that's how you did research once upon a time. Well, I remember she came back after a week or two and said, I can't find anything. And I said, it's probably because you're not gonna find anything. Uh, these things just really don't amount to much. So um, if you ding the anterior capsule, you know, maybe once or twice as you're doing your PI, uh, guess what? You're, you're, it's probably uh, a nice picture. You know, if you can actually see it, I bet this happens more times than we, we uh, you know, we'd probably uh, uh, think because uh, we just don't dilate that much or we're not looking. But, uh, you know, if you see something like that, take a picture, send it into a magazine, maybe you'll, you'll win a prize, but it's probably not going to develop into a visually significant cataract or a cataract at all or, you know, be of any uh, consequence other than a curiosity. All right, what about retinal damage? Is it possible? I'm doing a YAG capsulotomy. I am doing a PI. Can I damage the retina? Can I hit the retina? It's possible, okay, it's not likely, but it's possible. You know, you never say never in medicine. There's always a possibility, okay? Now with, uh, with, with PIs actually, now as soon as you cut through the iris, uh, retina's on the other side, okay? So laser light will be transmitted posteriorly. However, if you're maintaining the proper plane of focus, it's very unlikely, in fact, it shouldn't be the case that you actually cause some posterior chamber or posterior uh, segment damage back there, okay, that you hit the retina, in other words. Um, and with green, even more so, because as long as you are maintaining focus, laser focus at the plane of the iris, by the time that beam diffuses to get to the retina, it's probably not uh, you know, in, a, in any sort of of shape to actually cause any damage. Um, you're more likely to find laser burns, and I've seen this in the periphery, okay, if you look, than in the posterior, okay, posterior pole. And, and by the way, these burns that you will see out in the periphery, you know, do we worry about those? Well, I burned the resina, retina. Am I going to have, you know, problems with neovascularization? What if I burned through Bruch's membrane? What if it was a really hot burn? And, and, uh, Am I going to develop, you know, CNB? Uh, the literature doesn't support that. I've never heard of that happening. Um, you know, just talking with colleagues over the years, I've never heard of that happening. So again, it's probably a curiosity. You're probably going to see that if you look, um, but not likely to amount to anything significant. Um, by the way, let me say one other thing about this. Uh, you're PI lens, okay, the one with the little magnification button. If you will look at that, most of these type lenses, in, you know, in theory anyway, started out as fundus lenses, okay? If you look outside the button, you know, you, you look through the button, you get magnification, that's what you use to shoot through. What happens if you shoot outside the button, okay? If you, next time you're in your office or have an opportunity to look at one of these, Look and see what uh, happens when you look outside the little magnification button. Everything is sort of minified, okay? Which means that that focus, if I shoot through that, that's pushed back, okay? So it's possible, it's possible that if you're not paying attention and instead of using the magnification button for the PI, you know, the area that you're supposed to use, you shoot through the periphery of that outside the button now you're shooting, you know, through an area of the lens that is going to push your focus back. And if the circumstances, you know, and the planets are aligned against you, you could wind up with a posterior segment burn. Okay, so be careful with those lenses. Understand how those lenses work and how you're supposed to use them. All right, one of, uh, again, when I get to, to this slide uh, in a classroom, especially if it's a CE with, you know, a bunch of doctors, I'm going to go, is there anybody in here that does not know how to manage a uveitis, an anterior uveitis? And I usually take a step back and I wait 
and nobody ever raises their hand and you hear crickets in the back of the room. Why? Because there is nothing special about an iritis, a uveitis, after a laser, after an anterior segment laser procedure. Okay? There's nothing special that I would do necessarily that I wouldn't do with an iritis that just came in off the street. Okay? We already know how to manage this. Okay? In fact, what do we do? You know, what do we do uh, usually after we do a procedure? Okay. We send them home with an NSAID or a steroid. Why? Because we're expecting a little inflammation. I mean, we've just added some energy into the eye. It's a controlled trauma. You can expect a little inflammation. Now, I, actually, I know a lot of people that don't. <laughs> Now, don't send their patients home with anything. But again, it depends on how the procedure went, how smooth. You know, did I have to use any extra energy? Did it take a little longer? You know, what's the condition of the eye ahead of time? So, there, you know, there are things that you need to consider before you decide what and for how long you're going to treat someone, you know, say with an NSAID or a steroid after a laser procedure. But again, generally, uh, I would say that uh, you can expect mild inflammation. Uh, and that's why we send them home you know, with the NSAID or the steroid. Um, but again, you know, the, 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 I would say that the effect, or not the effect, but the condition of the eye is going, you know, before you start the laser, is going to have some effect on how much inflammation you know you're likely to see or not see afterwards okay so understand what you're doing understand you know the person's status uh you know has there been a recent trauma is there a history of chronic uveitis you know et cetera et cetera because that you know helps inform your decisions with regards to what sort of uh you know therapy i may want to prescribe on the way out of the office all right okay so if there is a complication here that you're going to have a nightmare about tonight, let it be this one, all right? Let's let's talk about this. Now again, elevated intraocular pressure. Doesn't that happen all the time? Yes, it does. Sort of expected. Yes, it is. It's probably one of the most common complications, if you can again call it a complication, that we're going to see with anterior segment lasers. Okay. But let me tell you this, there is a certain demographic of patient out there, and I can't tell you necessarily who they are, although again, the patient with a, you know existing history, you know, chronic uveitis, or prior history of trauma, et cetera, et cetera, you know, they're maybe a little more prone to this. You know, your, uh, your diabetics that have had vitreous bleeds and a capsulotomy may be a little more prone to this. There is a certain demographic of patient out there that's going to spike a pressure after the PI, the YAG cap, the SLT, the, the you know, green, the GLT. They're going to spike a pressure. And you know what? You're not going to be able to get it down the way you normally do. You're going to start putting every drop you have on your shelf in there, and it's not going to touch it. In fact, the pressure will continue to climb. You will reach for the orals, okay, the acetosolamide, and you'll give them the tablets, and it's not going to touch it, and the pressure is going to climb, okay? So we recognize that there is that demographic of patient out there where they will spike a pressure. It's usually over 10, and you will not be able to get that pressure down by conventional means, okay? Which means what's our option? Well, the way we're going to get the pressure down is to actually pull water out of the vitreous. And to do that, we're going to have to use some sort of hyperosmotic. Okay, now, why is that? I mean, what causes this? Your guess is as good as mine. Okay, um, I would say that maybe it's a trabeculitis. Okay, you, you, the patient just couldn't tolerate the amount of energy, or maybe you know something is swirling around in there. Okay, remember your your diabetics with vitreous bleeds, uh, a lot of that blood never really, it settles. Those red cells become ghost cells. They become red cell casts and they settle. And if you have an open capsule and you are stirring things up in the eye, even if it's the anterior chamber, you know, especially if you have an older person with a very liquefied or synergetic vitreous to begin with, you know, it's possible that some of that stuff finds its way anterior. 
Um, diabetics, diabetics, especially the way out of control diabetics, have a lot of glycogen vacuoles in the iris. And I mean, I see this with cataract surgery. You're going to spread, you're going to liberate a lot of pigment. You know, maybe that's got something to do with it. Maybe it's a combination of, of you know, all of the above um, or something yet to be described. But what we do know is that you're not going to be able to get the pressure down with drops or pills, okay? Which means that if you are doing anterior segment lasers, if you're an OD in a state where you have the authority to do this, you need to have plan B on your shelf, okay? Just in case you run into one of these folks, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna send them to the ER or the urgent care somewhere where they can start an IV and they're gonna get, you know, IV mannitol or dextrose, you know, some hyperosmotic to pull the water out of the vitreous, all right? Now, if we were, if this was a live audience right now, someone in the back, it's usually someone in the back would be saying, well, well, what about the oral stuff? I don't need to send them to the ER. What about the orals? Um, has anyone here ever tried an oral hyperosmotic? You know, there, there used to be something called Osmoglin, which I don't know if you can even buy anymore. But I'll tell you what, if that is, if that is plan B, okay, if that's your plan B, at the end of this, you know, uh, if you're on your way home or, or tomorrow on your way home, swing by the drugstore and buy a bottle of glycerin, okay? And then go home, turn on the TV, and try to drink that thing and see what happens to you, okay? And plan B is not, is not oral hyperosmotic. It's not anywhere in my vocabulary or on my shelf, okay? I'm going to send them to the ER and I'm going to call them up and say, I need, I'm referring a patient. They need IV hyperosmotics. Here's what happened. You know, their pressure uh, it has increased following this procedure. We've done all the, you know, the routine, uh, you know, therapy, and uh, this is the next step. Okay. The company line on these patients is IV hyperosmotics. Okay. Because if you send them home, and their pressure continues to climb. You know, some of our patients, for example, you know, they drive in for an hour. Okay? And, and by the way, on those patients, don't check their pressure five, 10 minutes after procedure and then send them home. You need to wait about an hour, honestly, okay? A lot of these pressure spikes occur between one and three hours post-procedure, okay? So, you know, what happens if this patient goes home to nowhere, Oklahoma, an hour or two away, and now their pressure is 60 in the middle of the night, and there's no help out there, okay? So that's why this, to me, this is probably the worst thing that can happen as far as complications with a, a, a laser, you know, procedure of some sort, because we're not going to be aware of it, and that patient may be out of reach and in dire straits with no help, okay? So just keep this in mind. How many times have I seen this? Uh, zero in 24 years. Came close once here at NSU. And they do a lot of lasers here at NSU. One time we had an instance where, uh-oh, here we go. Guy's pressure was climbing. It was in the 30s. I think it hit mid-40s. But luckily, it was early in the day. We kept them here all day. You know, we gave them everything we had here. I was getting ready to make the call. And finally, the pressure sort of stabilized and started to come down. Okay. So you're not going to see this maybe ever in your career, but, you know, you still take CPR and you learn, you know, how to manage those kind of emergencies just in case. Well, this is one of those situations. If you're going to be doing lasers, you need to have that just in place plan B on the shelf just in case. All right. What else? Uh, is this possible? Now, what's wrong with that, number one? Number one, the PI is in the wrong place, right? You never put a PI at 12 o'clock. Why? Because that's where all the bubbles go, and then you can't see. Is it possible that deform the pupil after uh, an anterior segment laser of some sort? Well, yeah. I mean, if you hit the iris, if you hit the sphincter, if you hit the dilator, you can damage the muscle. You may have some irregularity. Okay. Um, what happened here? Well, maybe that was a little mid to mid iris, you know. Although I do have to confess that is totally photoshopped, all right? I couldn't find one, so I photoshopped. I thought it was a pretty good photoshop, okay? But, you know, something like this, can it happen? Certainly. Is that fixable? Is there anything you can do for that pupil? Number one, it's, it's probably just a cosmetic thing, okay? The patient's probably not even going to be aware that the pupil's a little regular following their laser procedure. 
unless someone tells them. Um, it's probably of no visual consequence, okay? Is that fixable? Yeah, I, I can go in there and, and I can do some fancy stitching. I can put what's called a mechanical suture in there or two and round that pupil up. Am I gonna do that? Am I gonna you know, take the patient back to surgery and uh, you know, run the risk of an intraocular procedure for something that's purely cosmetic? Uh, someone's really gonna have to twist my arm. It's not gonna happen just because the patient looks and goes, I don't like the way it looks in the mirror. Okay, uh, there would have to be a compelling reason. But uh, again, this is feedback, you know, for you. Be be careful about where you put the spot, and uh, and then you shouldn't run into a situation like this. Visual disturbances. Uh, hey, doc, I can't see as well after the procedure as I could before. Okay, usually this is always explained with your post-op slit lamp you know exam before you let them go home uh is i first thing i look at obviously is the cornea is there a big abrasion there from the lens did i wash out all the the gonosol or cellulisk or whatever the goo is that i was using to, to put the lens on um maybe the patient is bleached out from all the flashing you know maybe they have poor macular function to begin with, begin with and the, the flashing has bleached them out uh pigment dispersion you know again diabetics have, uh, especially the, the out of control diabetic, diabetics will release a lot of pigment. Okay, I, I see that after cataract surgery. Um, so almost always you can explain this uh, by just taking a look and it's almost always you know, intermittent and something that will take care of itself. Okay? I've never had someone after a laser say, I can't see as well afterwards and not been able to explain it and not seen the situation take care of itself. What is malignant glaucoma? Well, can you get malignant glaucoma after a laser procedure? Yes, you can. Um, remember, malignant glaucoma or aqueous misdirection usually occurs in the, in the context of a trauma. Um, you know, and, and that may be a surgery, that may be a planned surgery. Maybe they had cataract surgery, you know, a couple of weeks ago or a month ago or, or even longer. Okay? Uh, so it almost always occurs in the context of a trauma or an eye that has been the recipient of some sort of trauma or manipulation. Okay, because what happens here is the aqueous, instead of you know coming around the you know the aqueous is formed in the ciliary body and posterior chamber, it comes around the pupil, and then it drains off you know at the angle. Well, what if it flows backwards into the vitreous? And what if it flows into the vitreous cavity? It finds a little pocket there within the vitreous gel and starts you know expanding forming a bleb within the vitreous gel well everything now is going to push forward as uh you know that cavity back there you know expands within the vitreous everything's going to shift forward okay malignant glaucoma um what do we do what do we do for malignant glaucoma can it happen after laser procedure yes it can i already said that okay so what are we going to do you know if you read some of the textbooks especially some of the older textbooks they'll say well what you want to do you want to take your laser, you want to shoot through the iris, you want to shoot through the zonules, you want to shoot, disrupt the anterior vitreous face, the anterior hyaloid, break up that bleb. Well, good luck doing that, okay? In a situation where the patient is uncomfortable, you know, the pressure is who knows what, cornea is probably very steamy, uh, they're you know, in, in a lot of pain. They're not cooperating. If you think that they have malignant glaucoma, that's a referral to posterior seg. Okay, you're going to send them the retina. If they think it's malignant glaucoma, what are they going to do? In the year 2020, they're going to do a vitrectomy. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to refer them. If I think they have malignant glaucoma, I'm not going to bother. Okay, they, that's a straight referral, emergent referral to retina. And I guarantee you that if that's what they think it is, they're getting a vitrectomy. Okay. What about CME? Can you get CME after a, you know, a YAD cap or a PI? Sure. When are you going to see it? You're going to see it as they leave the office? A week later, you know, they come back for a follow-up? No, you're going to see it 
within the same time span that you see it, say, with cataract surgery. It's going to take three or four weeks or longer, okay, because it takes time for those prostaglandins that are released at the site of injury to seep back into the vitreous and migrate back and bathe the macula and cause the CME, okay? So this is something you're going to see, you know, probably several weeks out. How do you manage it? The exact same way you manage it for cataract surgery. Okay? There's no difference. You're going to put them on an inset, and it's probably going to resolve, you know, on its own. Okay, if it doesn't, refer to retina. You know, maybe they will consider an intravitreal implant, okay, of a steroid. But you know, generally, uh, you manage this the exact same way you manage CME following cataract surgery. Um, you know, an inset, acular, time, and it resolves on its own. And you keep watching, and you know nowadays we have the luxury of OCT, but uh, you know in general that's going to resolve on its own. Okay, what about hemorrhage with a, a green laser trabeculoplasty? So what you're going to see here, and I'm talking actual bleeding into the anterior chamber, not blood in Schlem's canal. You know, one time I had a, a resident tell me, oh, I'm get, I've got bleeding. You know, they did a GL or an ALT. This was way back. And I go in there and I don't see any bleeding. What I see is, you know, you've got a little blood in Slim's canal, but that's, that doesn't count. Um, bleeding into the AC, you're going to do the exact same thing you did with the PI. Hold pressure. Talk about books and, you know, what their dog's been doing lately and, you know, what their favorite salad is or something. You know, just wait a few minutes and it's going to stop and then you finish the procedure. Okay. And we know from experience that, uh, you know, the efficacy of the procedure actually is not altered because they had a little hemorrhage and we had to put pressure and it delayed us a little bit and then we completed the procedure, okay? So you're going to do the same thing you did with a bleeding iris from the PI. What about this? You have, again, corneal burns from a GLT. Now, think of the light path here. It's bouncing off a mirror and going that way. So most likely, you're not going to see this as you're doing the procedure. You know, you're going to see after, you know, you've completed the procedure and you're looking with a slit lamp, you know, what are those little, you know, little spokes there at the periphery, some quadrants, uh, you know, that may be uh, burn. Okay, maybe the patient jerked, okay, again, patient's fault. Patient jerked at the wrong time or moved at the wrong time and you hit the corner. Right there. Again, transient, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, you know, if, if you want to, you, you're going to probably send them home with a steroid anyway if you're doing a GLT. That's probably going to be all you need to do for the cornea as well. What are these? You've got peripheral anterior synechia. What does that tell you? Say with, with GLT, was my laser spot too far anterior, too far posterior? Too far posterior, okay? So again, this is feedback to you. Be careful where you put those laser burns. Right, for me, and this is just me, I can almost always tell, no matter how much pigment or lack of pigment there is in the angle, I can almost always tell where the scleral spur is, okay? So to me, the scleral spur is like the shelf, and your laser spots should be on top of that, okay? So if you can find the scleral spur, the burns go on top, okay? Not behind or not below, but on top of the scleral spur, all right? So again, it generally doesn't alter the efficacy or affect the efficacy of the procedure, but it's feedback to you, you know, be careful where you put the spots next time. All right, that uh, I think wraps it up. And, uh, you know, I had, again, I had to uh, improvise here with my laptop. I had added a slide on uh, my other presentation that I have at home that uh, I couldn't give you because of telephone internet issues. Basically, just a, a recap, or not a recap, but uh, uh, a little uh, intro into what we will be doing next year. So this really wraps up uh, these webinars for uh, this year. So that's it for 2020. Uh, who's going to be sorry to see 2020 go? I don't think very many people. Um, next year, probably starting uh, late uh, January, we're going to pick up with these again. We're going to do a lot more webinars. Uh, in fact, we're going to also introduce another uh, live uh, online uh, interaction, which uh, I'm just calling uh, the ASOS Coffee Shop, where we're just going to meet 
at a specified time and hopefully you know technology will be working and we'll just sit and chat okay about anything you want to talk about so uh, look for those we'll be sending out emails on all of this uh, we'll probably have some more laser okay and some more aesthetics maybe we can get dr mcgee to come back and give us a little more aesthetics uh, the theme if there is going to be a theme for uh, the first half of 2021 then we'll be moving into office surgery okay and i'm going to start with uh, office anesthesia so there will be a couple of webinars on that as well as uh, injection technique okay and again we will mix in you know probably more laser or aesthetics you know along with that but uh, you know that'll be uh, i would say the theme for the first half of 2021 and then the latter half, uh, probably beginning uh, summer of 2021, will actually move into office procedures, okay? So that sort of gives you a little uh, uh, heads up on what we're gonna be doing. Um, I wanna take the opportunity to thank everybody that was involved uh, in this, these past uh, three months. You know, we did, what, six webinars in three months. Uh, that happened because of, uh, you know, the, uh, assistance and the uh, the resources provided by a lot of people uh luminous number one larney harneet thank you very much uh couldn't have done this without you uh dr uh, selena mcgee okay from uh precision vision in edmund dr Alyssa coin from salis okay pennsylvania college of optometry at salis dr elizabeth wiles at the illinois college of optometry Dr. Cliff Caudill at the Kentucky College of Optometry at the University of Pikeville. Dr. Jim Hunter, okay, from IU and the Indiana Board. Uh, you know, all these people gave of their time and resources, uh, strictly volunteering, you know, uh, to the AS for the ASOS as they've done for the past three years. So, you know, we need to thank them, and uh, most of all, thank you. Uh, the audience because uh, you know without interest uh, we would just be spinning our wheels here but really uh, you know this is this is for you this is again to develop resources and a network of people that you can call and rely on uh, as you you know look to the future and uh, you know this is the future of optometry so thank you uh, Larney do we have any questions that I can address before we sign off Thank you for that, Dr. Castillo. We do have one question that came in um, from Craig Bolt. Is there a PCO which is too dense to YAG? I have not encountered one. I have seen some PCOs with uh, very thick, uh, you know, L. L. Schnick pearls, clumps, you know, here and there. Um, I don't think I've ever encountered one that's too thick to yag, though. So I would say not in my experience. Uh, if you have one that thick, I would question as to whether or not that was actually PCO or did somebody leave something there after the cataract surgery. Um, I, I've yet to come across. I've, I've hit some, you know, some tough ones, and yeah, occasionally, I guess uh, I will have. I would have been over two, you know, millijoules. Uh, but I don't think I've encountered one yet that uh, I haven't been able to treat, you know, with a laser. As far as a cloudy capsule is concerned. Awesome. Another question came in from Dr. Raymond Grill. Do you do any vitrolysis procedures? I have not been doing any vitrolysis. There are ODs in Oklahoma, okay, and I believe in Louisiana that uh, have been doing some of that. Um, I'm generally of the, you know, I, I go back to the, uh, you know, the era of, uh, I don't know if anyone here remembers the Pico second laser of the, uh, the late 80s. You know, the Pico second laser was supposed to do what the Femto does now. And there was, I remember an ophthalmology group there in Tulsa that purchased one of these things for whatever, you know, four or $500,000 at the time. And, uh, Three, four months later, it was sitting in a corner. No one used it. I remember the Holmium laser of the late 80s, early 90s that they were trying to do ab externo trabeculectomies with. Some of you may remember that. Uh, you know, FDA approved uh, uh, equipment and procedure. And then some months into the ex mass market experience, all of a sudden we start having problems with hypotony and you know, uncontrollable problems with hypotony. 
that went, you know, by way of the graveyard. Um, I don't know if you all rem remember the Fugo blade, which is sort of like a laser, you know, for doing uh, capsule rexus. That never really took off. So, you know, I, I've sort of been uh, around long enough to understand that just because something is FDA approved doesn't mean that, you know, you just jump on the bandwagon. Uh, you know, I, now I, I will admit, you know, there are people that, you know, want to get in early and capture market share and all. But, uh, you know, I've, I'm a little more conservative than that. And in fact, you know, a few months ago, there was actually an article published. Well, the Academy of Ophthalmology put this on the AAO website. And I've rarely seen them do this. OK, so they put you can go to the AAO website and probably look this up. Uh, in fact, I may look it up and put it on the ASOS website, you know, along with the handout for this talk. Um, the title was something like laser vit vitrolysis offers no uh, visual improvement, you know, or something to the sort. And if you read into it, something like 66, 67 percent of uh, the patients in this study were not happy with the outcome of their laser vitrolysis. So, uh, you know, other people are doing this. That's fine. I'm still in my wait and see mode and I will wait and see. Perfect. So with that, you know, um, I think that wraps up the majority of the questions. Uh, most of them are really feedbacks from other doctors who attended um, saying thank you for providing us to a really nice lecture. Yeah. And again, um, I apologize for this, you know, emergency setup. What I'm going to do is I'm going to record this and put it on the ASOS website. And you will also find the handout that goes with this uh, on the website. So you will have uh, you know, these resources available to you. And Larnie, I'm, uh, we've been recording this presentation, right? Yes, this yeah, presentation. Okay. So that'll, that'll also be available within a few days. So, uh, you know, the resources are there. All the other webinars, by the way, are still up and will be up uh, on uh, the ASOS site. So, uh, you know, if you're not an ASOS member, Please join us. Okay, you can go to uh, here's here's my my shameless plug. Go to odslt.com. That stands for OD Surgery and Laser Training. Pretty clever. dot com and uh, and join us. You know, help grow this network. Uh, let us know what you need. Okay, we are here to provide resources for you. If you don't tell us what you need, we're just kind of guessing. But uh, you can help us out by tell us, telling us specifically, you know, what is it that we can do to help you out, okay? And again, join us, more than happy to have you. Perfect, well, with that in mind, uh, we should conclude this session. Thank you, Dr. Castillo. Thank you to the entire ASOS team. And we'll see you next year, bye. Happy holidays, all. <laughs>